Hello, junkies. You are fantastic. Don't let anybody tell you any different, unless it's me later on saying you're like only semi-fantastic. Either way, there's a lot of fantastic in you. Oh yeah. So much behind the scenes stuff going on right now. I am in the process of finishing up the Stone Wolves. That is the GFL novella. And when I say words like novella like that, that means I'm saying them in air quotes. Why in air quotes you ask? Because right now the uh, Stone Wolves, a GFL a novella is 125,000 words on what was supposed to be a 40,000 word story. It is an entirely new, full GFL novel, y'all, which means your long, 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 oh yeah, long wait will be rewarded. Why? Because you get not only one, but two GFL novels, maybe out by the end of the year in 2020, or at the very least early, out early in 2021. You get The Stone Wolves, which I can't tell you anything about yet. And of course, you're going to get GFL book six, The Gangster. Together, these twins clocking at somewhere around 300,000 total words. That would be around 35 hours of audiobook fun. That would be around 1,000 pages in paperback form, even longer than that, and all for you. Now, I didn't want the book to be, uh, I didn't want the Stone Wolves to be that girthy, to have that much turgitude, to be that, that swollen, uh, and engorged. I just, I didn't, I didn't want that much, but that is the story that had to be told. I co-wrote that with JC Hutchins, who did a great job framing out the story and cr- coming up with some of the characters. And we, we've collaborated on it hand in glove all this time. And now it is just a, it is a, it is a, it is a big, 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 a big one. So get ready because while I usually tell you that you don't have to read the novellas to know what's going on in the main chassis of the GFL in books one through six. This time, this time, I strongly recommend that you plan on reading both The Stone Wolves and GFL book six, The Gangster. You've waited a long time. Why not get two novels, two novels, and uh, and and take them all in? Because there's stuff that happens in The Stone Wolves you're going to need to know for GFL six. And there's stuff that happens in GFL six you're going to need to know for the, Sto- the Stone Wolves. They go hand in hand. We will have publication date and other information as to when and where you can get it in the future. I don't have that for you right now. What we're going to do now is hop into the Wayback Machine and travel to the year 2008. Uh, We are in the middle of the Nocturnal Throwback podcast. Now, a quick note, you guys. I've received some lovely supporting emails and delightful comments from people giving me you know, giving me positive thoughts based on stuff that happened that they heard about in the last couple of episodes of Nocturnal Throwback, but that is stuff that happened back in 2008. Uh, remember, we are re-podcasting this story. This originally came out in 2007, 2008. So after you hear the opening talkie talk of an episode, which you're listening to right now, the opening talkie talk, then we switch over to the talkie talk I said back in 2007 and 2008 to give you a little bit of a time capsule on how much things have changed in my career and in my life. So everything you hear after the initial opening talk, you talk, that's from the long ago time. But still, thank you nonetheless. Uh, your your kindness and support of the stuff that I do and in my personal life goes a long way. I appreciate it very much. And I think you are, no, you know what? I changed my mind. You're fully fantastic. You're not half fantastic. You're splendid wonderful, and you smell an awful lot like flowers. Now, after the upcoming sounder, we then switch to me talking to you from back in 2008, when I was writing a chapter of Nocturnal and recording it each week and releasing it to you. So now we're going to go ahead and do that. Ladies and gentlemen, junkies of all ages, enjoy. Welcome to the free podcast novel, Nocturnal. This is episode number 32. Nocturnal is a podcast-only novel you can't buy in stores and you can't peek at the end. Written and performed by Scott Sigler. More information and more free stories available at scottsigler.com. This book contains adult language, mature situations, and lots and lots of violence. Hello, my junkies, and we are back with Nocturnal. Only a couple episodes left, and it will finish in September of 2008. If you want to know exactly when it's going to finish, you can go over to scottsigler.com. I have put up the 2008 FDO podcasting schedule 
which I will include in the show notes of this episode of Nocturnal. This is episode number 32. Coming up at the end of this episode, I've got a promo for Seth Harwood's new book, Young Junius. I've got a promo for the Second Floor Lounge Music Podcast, and we're going to talk about the two contests that are going on, including the design of the spaceship, the PUV James Keeling, which is the featured ship in a four-episode miniseries that I'll have coming out in a couple of months called The Crypt. That's right, all the characters that you've heard about over the past few months and all the ones you'll be hearing about in the coming weeks are all going to finally meet on the ship, and Tom Fuckery will ensue. The other contest is to design a unit insignia for a military unit that actually is in the book Contagious, which is now finished. So all you artsy-fartsy types, make sure you tune in and listen up at the end of the show. Now we're going to roll into the story so far with an old-school friend of the show and the author of Young Junius, as well as the Jack Wakes Up books, Seth Harwood. Junkie, junkie, junkie. It's me, it's your boy, Seth Harwood. Looks like all is good in the world of Siglerism. Contagious is done. The FDO is back to putting up episodes of Nocturnal. And I know you want it. I know you need that new episode of Nocturnal like I need it. I know you're crying like a dog for that episode. Because it's been a long time since this thing started. And we want to know what's going to happen to all the people. I'm going to give you the story so far, right after I tell you about what I've going on at SethHarwood.com. I hope you've checked out Crime Wave. It's my new crime version answer to Escape Pod, Pseudopod, and all the other pods. It's the C-R-I-M-E-W-A-V, where I bring you a fresh, short story from some of the best contemporary crime writers right now, every single week, on Sundays at CrimeWave.com. So check it out. Come on over there. I hope you've also heard of my new novel that I'm putting out. It's the prequel to Jack Wakes Up. That's right. It's the original high school yearbook of young Junius. Junius Pons, as you've never seen him before, as a 14-year-old caught on the streets of Metropolitan Boston, rocking it, tearing it down in a gang war, that you have to listen to and ultimately one day read to believe. So check out both of those things at SethHarwood.com where you know you can find me, ya boy. Here is the story so far. San Francisco homicide detective Pookie Chang is at the murder scene of Roberta Depravdachuk and her husband waiting for a call from John Smith, a.k.a. Black Mr. Burns, the BMB. John is trying to find information regarding Marie Luttrell, the one rumored to be the leader of Marie's children. Brian Clouser, Alder Jessup, and Adam Jessup just rescued Jebediah Erickson, the savior, from an attack at the hospital. Brian and company survived a run-in with Pierre, Sly, and King Rex de Pravdichuk and are now fleeing the scene in the Jessup's armed station wagon with Erickson and badly wounded SFPD officer Brian Green in the back. Firstborn, the former leader of Marie's Children, attacked the San Francisco morgue and killed Dr. Stone Mason, torturing him to find the location of medical examiner Robin Hudson. Once he had it, Firstborn called other nocturnals and told them to go to her apartment and take her out. You're crying for this. I know you are. I know you're crying for it. Robin arrived at her apartment, picked up her beloved dog Emma from her neighbor, Big Gay Max, then started for her place just one door down. But at the base of that door, she saw shadows. Someone was in her apartment. Who is it and what's going to happen? We find out now. Pookie Chang wanted a new line of work. Maybe something in the male escort area. Sure, he was no Richard Gere, but he could put the bone to some lonely old rich woman as well as the next guy. Hell, one round of the Chang Bang, and he could charge double. Anything was better than being a cop. Too much blood. Too much death. 
Roberta deprived of Chuck and her husband. This was just some fucked up shit. A chainsaw? Seriously? A Colombian necktie? Come on. Rex deprived of Chuck had watched way too many movies. Pookie could only hope he hadn't squirreled away copies of The Godfather, or he'd eventually have to partner up with the animal cops. The professionals were on the job now. Blood splatter guys, evidence techs. There wasn't much for Pookie to do but hang out and look important. He'd had enough of this beat. Honestly. How much of this twisted shit did one man need to see? Wasn't his punch card full by now? Could he turn it in for 10% off the next gig? Maybe something in administration. Chief Chang. Yeah, that had a nice ring to it. So tired. Dragging. Somehow, it even took effort to blink. His cell rang, and he checked the caller ID. Black Mr. Burns. What's up, BMB? You do that research on Marie Luttrell for me yet? Papa needs him some info. I'll get to that in a second, Burns said. But holy shit, Pooks, you hear about the morgue? No. Blood all over the front desk. God is missing. They know somebody died in the morgue proper on account of some more blood there, but no bodies. Pookie's chest spiked with a cold rush of fear. The morgue. Robin, Robin, Bo Bobbin. Who was the on-duty medical examiner? No one was scheduled to be there, BMB said. Frank McCourt was on call, but he came in after the fact, after the news came across. He's fine. The guard's logbook said Stone Mason was there. He's been working with Robin, but Robin had left for the day. How long ago? Fifteen minutes before the bodies were found, so about twenty minutes ago. And here's the fucked up thing, Pooks. Marco Gastineau's corpse is gone. And get this, there's an APB out for the ninja. What the fuck for? For the murder of Francis Parkmeyer. Ninja's gun was found at the scene. Robinson called it in. Brian's gun found at a murder scene. Brian's gun, which Sub-Chief Robertson had taken. This was about as friendly as evicting a double-sized turd peppered with broken glass. Marco's body gone. Morgue murders. Parkmeyer dead. Chief Zoe trying to cover up the case. Robertson planting Brian's gun and framing the ninja for the murder. Zoe and Robertson had finally crossed all the way over. No hurdle was too big. They were going to cover it up, cover it all up, no matter what they had to do. Robin, Brian, and Pookie would be next on the hit list. Pooks, you there? Pookie kept the phone pressed to his ear, but started turning, looking at all the cops on the scene. Which one of them was in Robertson's pocket? What had Zoe promised? Which one was waiting to put a bullet in Pookie's ear? Pooks, man, you there? John, listen to me. Find Tonda Murphy. Tell her to get the Robins right now. You know Mr. Business? Yeah, that uh, fortune teller dude with Tourette's? That's him. Go get him and take him to Robbins. And don't take no for an answer. Arrest him if you have to. Hell, rough him up if you must. Whatever it takes. But get his ass out of there. And don't talk to anyone. Don't be alone with any cop. Don't answer calls from anyone but me or the ninja. You got it? Pooks, what the fuck is going on, man? Robertson and Zoe are making their move. Anyone who knows about the Savior and the symbols could be a target, and that includes you. Man, I am so glad I hang out with you guys. You know how I crave excitement and mental stimulation. Tell me about it. Watch your ass, BMB. Pookie hung up. He slid into his car, eyes still scanning, looking for the cop that would try and punch his ticket. He didn't tell anyone he was leaving the scene. He just started the brown Buick, put it in gear, and took off. A fucked up cop in the back. A fucked up octogenarian monster killer in the front passenger seat. An antisocial weaponsmith driving. His left cheek hanging down like a flap of dirty, bloody cloth. Broken collarbone that felt like a napalm dildo being driven through his shoulder and all the way down into his lung. And now, an old man who used a cane gun, coming at him with a four-inch knife in one hand and what looked like a strange white stapler and a blue syringe in the other. Get the fuck away from me, you freak! Brian screamed. There was no room to maneuver in the back of the black Dodge Magnum. Brian tried for his guns, but they were empty. Wrist blade, gone. Forearm knives, gone. He pushed his back against the door 
and raised a foot to kick. Stop this nonsense, you sissy, Alder Jessup said. You kick me and I'll give you a silver dust enema that will have you defecating blood for the duration of your short and agonizing demise. And put that fucking thing away! My God, Jessup said. This is the future of the saviors. This. You're like a little girl. A little girl? You want to cut into my shoulder for fuck's your sake? Your collarbone is broken. I can see it from here. If we don't get in there and set it now, it's just going to heal wrong. And then we'll just need to re-break it and go in anyway. You ain't a doctor and this ain't no hospital. That bone will refuse in the next 15 minutes, Alder said. I need to cut in, set it, and use this bone glue. There may well be more action tonight. You need proper use of your arms. Fuck that, Brian said. Get me to a motherfucking hospital right now. No one can heal that fast. You can. Erickson can. And I need to staple your cheek back in place. You're bleeding all over my car. Why don't you crawl into the front and fix Erickson, Florence fucking Nightingale? He needs a transfusion. We've got plenty of blood back at the house. We'll fix him when we get there. Now, for God's sakes, man, could you stop being such a pussy? <laughs> Brian felt his phone buzz in his right pants pocket. He kept his foot cocked back, ready to smash Alder's head, and reached in to check the caller ID. It was a text from Pookie. It read... Robin in trouble. Get to her apartment. Now, now, now. The surreal battle against the dog-faced monster. Jumping out of a third-story window. A John Woo shootout in the middle of a hospital. All terrifying. And all of those things faded away to nothing. Paled in comparison, the second he read that Robin might be in danger. Alder was right. There might very well be more action that night. Adam, Brian said. Get me to church in 24th right now. Run people over if you have to. I don't care. Just get us there. The tone of his voice left no room for debate. For once, Adam didn't even give a smart-ass comment. The surly young man cranked the car hard left, a 25-mile-an-hour Yui that took them south on Portrero. They were only about five minutes away. Brian put his feet down and squared his shoulders to face the old man Alder Jessup and his double handful of improvised surgical gear. Go ahead, Brian said. Alder started with the stapler. Max, no, Robin whispered, an urgent hiss of dissuasion. Let's get out of here. Let the cops handle this. But you are the cops. Big Gay Max held an aluminum baseball bat in his very big left hand. The bat looked like a child's toy, like he was a coach for the local t-ball team fetching bats for practice. In his right hand, he held a leather leash attached to the thick collar surrounding Bill Bob Batting's massive pit bull neck. Every muscle in the dog's body seemed to twitch. He'd picked up on his master's excitement about impending violence and was ready to follow Max into any fight. Robin had a brief vision of what might happen were Max and Billabub out for a nighttime walk in the Castro district and some frat boys came by looking to go gay bashing on some effeminate victim. I'm a medical examiner, Max. This isn't CSI for the love of God. Oh, come on. You can't let criminals drive you out of your own home, girl. We need to go in there and take care of business. Besides, I beat people up for a living. Let's rouse them out of there. Where's your gun? In my apartment. You're kidding me. Robin shook her head. Now is not the time for a safety lecture. Let's get out of here. You already called 911. Billabub and me are just going to go bust some heads. Max, please, Robin said. Just get me out of here. Max's muscles were twitching just like his dog's. He wanted to mix it up in the worst possible way. He tensed for a second then sighed. Fine. You win, honey. Let's just go. Robin felt a wash of relief. She quietly opened Max's apartment door. As it swung open, she caught a whiff of something stale. Something foul. A smell she'd smelled before. A harmless thing that for some reason rocked all the alarm bells in her head. It was the same thing she'd smelled on Alex Panos, only much stronger. The door opened all the way. Out in the hall, a man covered in a rancid, blue and green striped blanket. He turned to face her. 
a huge forehead, two feet wide, misshapen, lumpy, and gnarled. Beady black eyes beneath it, staring right through her. And beneath the eyes, a slowly spreading smile. It reached for her, hands moving faster than anything she'd ever seen. She didn't even see the move, really. One second, they were somewhere beneath the moldy blanket, and the next they dug into her shoulders like bear traps. The thing reared back its giant head. A growl. An I'm-not-fucking-playing-around growl, and then a streak of white and black out of the corner of her eye. Emma's teeth locked down on the man's thick left thigh. She shook her head like a wild thing, like a crocodile, as far from her lapdog cuddly nature as a kitten is from a saber tooth. Blood sprayed across her snarling muzzle. The man's beady eyes widened and he screamed. His bear trap hands let go, just for a bit. And then there was another hand on Robin's shoulder, from behind, pulling her away. Robin fell hard to her ass, sliding across the hardwood floor, her eyes never leaving the scene. Max had pulled her away with his right hand. His left hand held the bat. He brought the bat back, grabbed it with both hands, and started to twist his big hips. The misshapen bum's hands locked on Emma's big, thick Labrador head. Fingers pointed and dug in. Robin's heart shredded instantly. This thing was going to kill Emma, just like that. Emma let go of the leg and tried to snap at his hands, but they were too big, too strong. The dog managed a half-second yelp, a high-pitched, pitiful thing that tore Robin's soul to shreds. And then Big Gay Max finished his swing. The aluminum bat hit the strange man right in his giant forehead, a metallic tonk that snapped his head back like a bobblehead doll. He fell back, laid out flat in a comic book drawbridge drop. A shotgun blast. A roar of death that filled Max's apartment, tearing the air to painful shreds. Max fell away from the door, his chest a ragged, shredded patch of torn shirt and wet red. Another thing, another monster, this one also wearing a nasty blanket, but with four arms. Four arms. Each of the top two arms held a sawed-off shotgun. The shotgun on the right trailed smoke from the barrel. The one on the left pointed at Emma, who somehow knew when to fight and when to run. She scrambled across the hardwood floor. Robin saw the right-hand shotgun grabbed by the bottom arms, which cracked it open and started to slide in two new shells. <laughs> the left-hand shotgun again filled the apartment with the sound of death. Emma turned sharply to the right, yelping, screaming, blood covering her white and black fur. It hadn't been as loud as the first blast, and Robin's hyperspeeded mind knew why. The forearm thing had only fired one barrel at Emma. It strode into the room and pointed the left-hand shotgun at Robin. She heard the sound of death again and felt something smash into her chest and knock her back. Her eyes never left the man. She'd been shot. But she didn't feel any pain. The monster's top right arm grabbed the freshly loaded shotgun from the bottom arms, which then started reloading the left-hand gun. He kept walking forward, only five feet away now. It pointed the shotgun right at her face. This was it. Another growl and a blur of furred muscle, leather leash trailing behind like Batman's cape. Bill above Batting's the pit bull locked his massive jaws on the forearm man's top right arm. The shotgun went off again, both barrels this time. Robin felt something hit her right shoulder. She felt pain this time. Oh, fuck yes she did, as her own blood splattered against her right cheek and shot into her right eye. She fell to her side. She heard a scream, a high-pitched thing that belonged to a woman or child, not a man. A shaking growl, and then a snap so pronounced it could have been fresh carrots. The scream got louder. So did the shaking growls. Her right arm wouldn't move. She reached over with her left hand and wiped the blood out of her eye. The forearm man's top right arm flopped sickly, broken in the middle of the forearm, sheeted in blood. Billabub had given up on the arm and gone for the throat. Three hands desperately grabbed at the dog's face skin, trying to stop the flashing white teeth from closing in on the jugular. Billabub Battings was one pissed-off pit bull. 
Emma was somewhere in the apartment, yelping, crying for her moss. The shotgun sat on the hardwood floor. Robin started to crawl towards it. The black Dodge Magnum screeched to a halt in a near head-on collision with a black and white cruiser and a shit-colored Buick. Big Tonda Murphy got out of the cruiser. Pookie Chang got out of the Buick. Sirens were approaching. Brian ignored his pain and got out of the charger. Alder had used a rifle strap to fashion a sling for his left arm. Brian already had his FN pistol in his right hand. Bri, Bri, what the fuck? Pookie said. What happened to your face? Brian ignored him, or maybe didn't even hear him. Brian walked to the apartment building's front door, a classic San Francisco-style door of glass and wood, covered with a black wrought iron grate. Brian kicked out with the flat of his right foot. The door shattered, bent, and flew off hinges that tore free from the old wood. The ruined door sailed into the wide entryway and skidded across the Spanish tile floor, glass pieces skittering in all directions. He sprinted for the stairs and started taking them three at a time, heading for the fourth floor. Pookie watched Brian run up the stairs. In the filthy, bloody, jet-black peacoat and skullcap, he looked like a different person. Now, it wasn't the coat. It was his face. An inverted V of metal staples holding his bloody cheek together, and an expression in his eyes that promised very bad things to anyone who got in his way. Pookie suddenly recognized that expression. He'd seen it only once before. On the face of Jebediah Erickson, the Savior. Brian was going to kill anyone that threatened Robin. Pookie sprinted up the stairs, following his friend. He heard heavy footsteps behind him as Big Tonda Murphy followed suit. Blood flew across the apartment. Big Gay Max wasn't moving. Bill above the pit bull had endless energy, endless noise, endless shaking violence. The four armed man's hands were bloody shreds. Billabub had landed one big bite on his face, tearing free a long shred of forehead skin. The lower left hand still flopped limp and broken. The lower right hand was reaching for something at the man's waist. Robin crawled for the shotgun, but it was so hard. Her right arm wasn't working. It was hard to breathe. She was sliding across the hardwood floor in the slickness of her own blood. The shotgun's wood handle sat so close, only a body length or two away. My God, did this hurt? She knew something was very wrong in her chest and stomach. Her doctor brain tried to list the symptoms, but her cop mind blocked the process. There was no time to think about the damage and what it meant. And that's when the window shattered, and a black, winged thing flew in like an angel of death. As he cleared the fourth floor landing, Brian heard the rapid-fire pops of a handgun. Almost at the same time, he heard the pitiful yelps of a dog's shock and pain. Robin's apartment was at the end of the hall, door wide open. Before that door, the door to Max's apartment. Laying half in the doorway, half in the hall, a homeless guy with a massive, swollen, gnarled forehead. Brian felt his chest buzz with recognition. One of Marie's children. Brian sprinted down the hall. Robin hadn't reached the shotgun in time. Chest down on the floor, she looked up at the thing that had just emptied a 35 millimeter magazine into Bill above battings, splattering the dog's brains all over the forearmed man and the apartment floor. Tall. Jet black skin that under any other circumstance she would have found beautiful. Shirtless. Muscles taut and free of body fat. Cool, dark eyes. A flawless complexion. An absolute Michelangelo-esque vision of male beauty, if not for the sagging flaps of skin that ran from the inside of the man's arms down to his waist. The man ejected his spent magazine from his handgun, reached into his jeans pocket, and drew another. 
As he clicked the magazine home, Robin had only one thought. Who was going to take care of Emma? Brian turned left and ran through Max's open door, hopping right over the big head's body. His eyes caught many things all at once. Max, prone on the ground, his chest a hamburger mess. A pit bull, still twitching, half its head gone. A four-armed man struggling to rise. An NBA center tall black man dressed in jeans and no shirt, pointing a 35 millimeter pistol down at Robin. And Robin, chest down, face covered in blood, a five-foot trail of blood stretching out behind her. He took all of this in in a tenth of a second. In the next tenth, the tall man turned and fired. Ryan dove to the left, part of his brain knowing that was a mistake even as he did it, even as he pointed his right arm and returned fire, flicking the trigger as fast as he could. He instinctively tried to reach out and break his fall, but the improvised rifle strap sling held his left arm fast. All his weight landed on his left shoulder, and the collarbone broke again. Some of his bullets might have hit. He wasn't sure. The room blurred before him as he landed on the ruined shoulder, ate the pain like candy and rolled to his knees. The black man moved like the shadow of a speeding car playing against a warehouse wall. A hand flashed out, grabbed the four-armed bloody mess. Then shadow and bloody mess man flew out the fourth floor window with a whoosh of passing air and a tinkle of broken glass. Holy shit, Brian! Pookie's voice from the doorway. Look at the melon on this mutant! Cuff him, Brian said. Call an ambulance! He scrambled to Robin's side. She rolled to her back just as he reached her. He slid his right arm under her neck, lifting her gently. Her right shoulder was a ragged lump of flesh, bone exposed in some places, blood sporadically pulsing out from multiple spots. But that wasn't the worst of it. Her chest... She'd taken a shotgun blast to the chest, a softball-sized pattern, starting at the top of her sternum and ending halfway to her waist. Blood soaked her shirt. He'd been a cop too long to be in denial, even for a second. The shotgun pellets had ripped into her heart, which probably had at least a dozen holes, filling her chest cavity with blood pumped by a shredded muscle that struggled to function, to find a rhythm to move ever-decreasing amounts of blood through her body. She didn't have long. Brian, she said, her voice quiet, resigned. She knew. They both knew. I'm sorry, Robin. I'm so sorry. She shook her head slowly, once to the left, once to the right. Not your fault. Where's my girl? Pooks, get Emma and bring her in here. He stared down at Robin. This just sucks, he said. She nodded. Indeed it does. At least, I got to tell you that I love you. I love you too, Brian said. I do. I have. I always will. She smiled, and somehow, that made it even worse. It opened the floodgates of emotion that had been blocked by the adrenaline. Tears poured from his eyes blurring her image a little, blurring her smile. He couldn't wipe the tears away. His right hand held her, and his left arm couldn't move. She reached up and wiped them away for him. Nice timing, champ, she said. He got that one just under the wire. Pookie stood over them, cradling a whimpering Emma. The dog's left hip was a sheet of blood. Only now did Robin look scared. Oh, God, is she? She'll be fine, Pookie said quietly. He knelt down and set the big wounded dog in her lap. She needs some shot taken out of her butt cheek, but but that's it. She'll be fine, Bo Bobbin. Now Robin smiled at Pookie. She reached up and touched his cheek, her fingers tracing a line of her own blood on his skin. Pooks, stop fucking married women, she said then turned her attention to Emma. The dog stopped whining, her still oozing wound darkening Robin's already blood-stained pants. Robin held the dog with both arms, pulling her tight, human blood further staining the dog's black and white coat. Emma whimpered and kissed Robin's face. 
It's okay, baby. It's okay. But it wasn't okay. Robin looked at Brian, Emma's tongue still dancing on her face. Brian, she's all I have. You take her. You love her. Brian nodded. He wanted to talk, but he couldn't. His throat locked up tight like a clenched fist. Do you, do you promise? Brian nodded again. Robin sagged in his arms. Her eyes didn't close, not like in the movies. They just stared out, dead and lifeless. Robin was gone. And there is episode number 32. 26 minutes of story. Not bad as I get back into the swing of things. Now, it looks like Nocturnal is going to drop every Sunday, right up until I finish the book. Should be two more episodes left. Could turn into three. I'm not really sure. So let's talk about those two contests I mentioned at the beginning of the episode. First is to design the PUV James Keeling, which is the primary ship in my new upcoming miniseries called The Crypt. This is going to be kind of the Sigler version of the Enterprise or Battlestar Galactica, which means it is a spaceship. The whole cast and crew are set in that spaceship. It's in the Rookie Universe. The main difference being that there's going to be a whole lot more murder, mayhem, torture, blood, death, monsters, nightmares, and all kinds of other things that would take place on a Sigler-created ship. If you are artistic, if you know people who are artistic, you want to get them to go look at my contest over at Pixish.com. And don't bother going there. Just go to ScottSigler.com, look at the show notes for Nocturnal Episode 32. I'll have a link to the contest. We already have 15 entries, some really good ones up there, of people trying to compete to have their design be the crypt, be the PUV James Keeling. If you're into sci-fi at all, you probably want to go take a look at this for the fun of it. Again, if you're artistic, you know people who are artistic, get them over there to enter. There's still three weeks left in the contest. Also in the show notes at scottsigler.com for Nocturnal Episode 32, the contest to design the unit insignia patch for the military unit that is featured in Contagious. So I'll probably be using this in all of the self-promotion marketing that I do for the book. Uh, If you've got artistic talent, go check it out. Could be a lot of fun. That's it for this week's episode of Nocturnal. Be sure to tune in next Sunday for more of the same goodness. And let's roll out with our promos, and I'll catch you guys in the next episode. Tired of hearing the same Pop Factory clones that seem to be all you can find on the radio these days? My name's Eric Ackerman, and I host the Second Floor Lounge. My mission is to find new music and bring it to you. I don't confine myself to particular genres. I miss the good old days when DJs played what they liked and you never knew what you might hear. My guide is whether I like a song and, usually, whether it gets stuck in my head. The playlist is eclectic, to say the least, with some of the wildest swings happening for holiday shows, Christmas and St. Patrick's Day being the biggies. If you like finding new music and supporting independent artists, swing by the lounge at secondfloorlounge.podshow.com or search for it in the iTunes podcast directory. I hope to see you soon. This fall, are you ready for crime? Young Junius, the podcast novel, serialized every week at SethHarwood.com, brings you the story of Junius Pons. As a teenager growing up in a Boston that crack cocaine is just starting to take hold of, he's running to escape the consequences of a murder he had to commit and fighting to avenge the death of his brother. But first, he has to find out who did it. So let Seth Harwood, the author of Jack Wakes Up, take you on a trip through crime, action, and violence this fall as he brings young Junius to SethHarwood.com, your home for serialized crime. You have been listening to Nocturnal. Written and performed by Scott Sigler. For more information, go to scottsigler.com. All music in this podcast provided by Uncrowned off their album Devils and Angels, available now at the iTunes Music Store. Is it-
Sun.